Today, uh, I am very pleased that we are marking the publication of a new Washington Institute study, uh, which is um, uh, um, a primer to help you, to help governments, to help informed, uh, uh, informed experts, to help public opinion understand the details, to understand what is at stake when uh, we talk about more generally the Iranian nuclear program. It is this. <coughs> Nuclear Iran, a glossary of terms, um, perhaps not the most exciting title in the world, uh, but it masks uh, within it a very, very interesting assessment and understanding of what is really at stake and what are the issues inside um, understanding the Iranian nuclear program. Um, uh, I'm especially pleased um, this, uh, this publication is a joint publication of the Washington Institute and the Belfer Center at uh, the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Um, and that reflects the partnership um, of the two authors of this publication, uh, Oli Heinonen and Simon Henderson. Um, uh, Oli um, is a senior fellow at the Belfer Center. Uh, he previously served as the Deputy Director General and Head of the Department of Safeguards at the IAEA the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, and uh, he was responsible for inspecting nuclear facilities in Iran and throughout the world. Uh, brings unparalleled uh, experience to the question of understanding the Iranian nuclear program. Um, he's joined in this exercise, as I said, by our own Simon Henderson. Simon is the Baker Fellow at the Institute and the director of our Gulf and Energy Policy Program. Um, he has his own uh, long personal experience, uh, both in Iran, um, where he, uh, uh, where he, uh, from which he reported um, uh, many moons ago as a foreign correspondent, and in dealing with nuclear issues, um, also um, from uh, which he reported on, um, both on Iran, on Pakistan, uh, and uh, and around the world. Uh, together, they make a powerful team. This is an excellent study. If you haven't already seen it, uh, please download it uh, at the Institute's website. Um, uh, we, I don't know, uh, do we have publications on the way out? Um, we don't have publications on the way out because we want you to go to our website um, uh, to read it and to take full advantage of it that way. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn to, uh, uh, to, o to Simon to make opening remarks. Uh, he will turn to Oli, um, and then we will uh, turn to your questions and answers. Simon. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming here on a uh, delightful August day um, <clears throat> where you should have been on the beach. Uh, and indeed, I was on the beach yesterday, but came home uh, back here uh, out of call of duty to do this uh, presentation today. Um, <clears throat> Uh, why this publication? Why me? Why Oli? Uh, the answer is that uh, Oli and I uh, share a uh, rather esoteric interest in centrifuges. And we uh, go off to quiet corners and discuss finer points of centrifuges. Uh, and um, uh, Sometimes people come along and try and join in the conversation, but we can usually twist the centrifuges a little further and they lose the point of why they're there. Uh, but our, uh, what we decided we would do would be to try to transfer some of our interest and knowledge in centrifuges uh, to, to a wider audience, and this study is the product of it. Um, in fact, there are going to be two products of our collaboration. Uh, this is the first one. Uh, the second one, uh, which uh, we're uh, about to start working on, uh, will also be on uh, much the same uh, subject area, uh, but I will leave it um, undefined at this moment. Uh, but for this publication, my name came first. Uh, for the next publication, Oli Heinonen's name will uh, uh, come first. Uh, that is uh, a mutual agreement, a mutual arrangement. Um, 
Oli is going to take a deep dive into the Iran nuclear question. My job is to set you up in readiness for that. Um, many of you, uh, judging by the faces, already know a lot about uh, the science and the technology of this issue. Uh, many of you uh, probably know more than I know about it. Uh, but my uh, uh, particular experience is that I've done a lot of work on it over the years, um, and I've spent a lot of time trying to explain it in layman's terms. Uh, and that, for the next five or ten minutes, I'm going to do uh, again. Uh, for those of you um, who uh, really know this stuff, um, I hope um, that my layman's terms are uh, interesting and not inaccurate. Uh, you're very welcome to borrow my analogies uh, for your own explanations uh, in future audiences. Um, and uh, for those who um, left um, school uh, with only an elementary knowledge of science, um, I will bring you forward so that you might be able to uh, understand a great deal of what Oli has said. Uh, for the record, um, I did do science at high school, um, and indeed I went to, uh, initially went to university to read what I would call um, metallurgy and you would call metallurgy. I, um, I decided after a very few weeks that this was not for me and I shifted at that point. Uh, the irony of all this is that um, uh, I have subsequently spent a considerable amount of uh, my time uh, talking to metallurgists or metallurgists of one form or another, um, trying to think of all the knowledge I should have gained at college, which I didn't. Right, the science is, um, is brief and straightforward. Um, Right. The trick of what uh, the nu any nuclear question about is fission. It is the uh, a uh, it it's, uh, is the story of atoms splitting and uh, releasing energy. There are essentially, for our purposes here, two forms of uh, fission. One is a controlled fission, uh, which is uh, when uh, the sort of um, reaction which takes place in a uh, power reactor um, where the uh, uh, energy released is used uh, to generate uh, electricity or generate power. Um, that is controlled. Um, there is also uh, uncontrolled fission uh, when there is uh, an explosive chain reaction, that's a cute way of saying an atomic bomb. Right. Uh, again, um, the challenge of this is you can go on the internet and sort of find this diagram all over the place, but the chances are it's 20 times more complicated than this and uh, most of you here wouldn't understand it. But the issue here is that uh, essentially uh, you can either make uh, a nuclear bomb uh, from uranium or you can make it from pl plutonium. Uh, plutonium uh, you have to uh, uh, obtain by reprocessing material from a power reactor. Uh, that um, is... Uh, rather dangerous but relatively simple chemistry um, and uh, but it is um, rather well controlled in that your chances of making a power reactor and uh, producing plutonium without the world noticing is very uh, very uh, little and so that is the attraction of the other way to a bomb which is enriching uranium uh, and um, uh, it, there used to be a time when um, people would say, uh, but plutonium bombs are much better. Notionally, they are. 
uh, because you need a smaller amount of plutonium to make a bomb than you do for, of in, uh, highly enriched uranium. Uh, that smaller amount means you can put it on um, a smaller missile or a smaller bomb um, and, um, and deliver it to its target. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, highly enriched uranium will also do the business, and these days there are missiles and their capabilities to put, uh, make these devices to be carried by aircraft, um, and the net effect on the target is very much the same. Um, this is a depiction of what a centrifuge is like. Um, a centrifuge essentially uses uh, the process of spinning uh, to uh, enrich uranium. What you want to do is um, natural uranium uh, is mainly made up of uh, an isotope called uranium-235, uh, sorry, 238. Uh, the isotope that uh, you want to use for either uh, a power reactor or if it is uh, in very high concentration for a nuclear weapon, is called uranium-235. The challenge here is that uh, uranium-235 is only 0.7% of any chunk of natural uranium you come across. Uh, so the challenge is to grab the uranium-235. In a centrifuge, you do that by making the uranium into a gas, a uranium hexafluoride, spinning it very quickly, uh, and um, uh, then uh, the uranium-235 uh, splits off from the uranium-238, and over a rather lengthy and complicated process, uh, you, in, uh, you uh, increase the enrichment, the so-called enrichment of uranium-235. Um, centrifuge a, it's called a uh, vertical spinning rotor. Try to think of it in terms of a top-loading washing machine. Um, in a, although it is not as wide as that, and it's much taller than that. Uh, but it, the analogy also works that uh, you want it to be on a very stable base uh, uh, surface, uh, probably on the concrete in the basement of your house, uh, rather than on the the first or uh, the second or third floor, and uh, you also want to load uh, the, your washing properly because if you just chuck it in there and then set the machine going, uh, it um, if it is not properly balanced, uh, it will knock against the, the side and not work properly. Those are two particularly important. Uh, issues that uh, are also transferable to a um, centrifuge enrichment uh, centrifuge, uh, sorry, uranium enrichment centrifuge. Oops. Hey. Oops. Somebody's. Uh, wrong direction. Right. I need help. <laughs> Maybe it can do it on this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Right. Um, this is the motif of the Dr. A. Q. Khan Research Laboratories in Pakistan, which is um, a uranium enrichment facility. Uh, Dr. A. Q. Khan, you're all familiar with as being uh, the Pakistani scientist who, uh, if you believe what he says, uh, said, uh, he says uh, is that uh, he did as he was told by successive political and military uh, governments in Pakistan. And if you believe what the Pakistan government says, uh, uh, it is that he was a rogue agent. He did it by himself. Uh, but he supplied, um, having acquired centrifuge technology while working in Europe, uh, he then uh, also supplied it to China, uh, uh, Libya, Iran, and North Korea. Now, uh, the, this particular emblem um, and his laboratories, uh, even though his, uh, he's now in disgrace, are still, uh, still bear his name. Um, this particular emblem is interesting insofar 
as um, it's a mathematical depiction of the strains and stresses, the forces, uh, on a centrifuge as it spins. Uh, the G uh, there is the center of gravity of the whole thing. Uh, the, there's only one particular message that I want to get across by showing this uh, today, is that it looks as though it's about to fall over. Um, and indeed, that is the challenge of spinning a centrifuge. Uh, it doesn't, uh, and it, it, the challenge is to make it spin perfectly vertically and not to fall over. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Oli is going to talk about that one, um, and so I'll move on to this. Um, there are two form, basically two forms of uh, making an atomic bomb. Uh, one is called the gun type, and the other is called the implosion type. Uh, the gun type, you take um, uh, a chunk uh, of uranium two three five, which is le uh, of less than a so-called critical mass and slam it into another chunk of uranium-235, therefore making a critical mass. Uh, you fire some neutrons in, into it at a critical moment and the whole thing goes bang. This is, um, a, uh, this is the sort which was dropped on Hiroshima uh, and it did go bang and they were so confident that uh, it would go bang that um, it was not tested before it happened. Uh, however, it's a rather crude thing, and uh, n nuclear weapon designers um, think it, uh, it, it lacks sophistication. So um, most people um, prefer to go for an implosion device, and this is where um, I will end. This is what we fear the Iranians are doing, um, and the, uh, the analogy here is that you're squeezing um, uh, a chunk of uranium into a critical mass. You could equally be uh, using plutonium um, uh, to, to make a critical mass of plutonium. Uh, for technical reasons, plutonium doesn't work in the gun type uh, device, which was the, uh, the earlier slide. Uh, the challenge of um, making an implosion device is to squeeze it symmetrically. Uh, and uh, in, uh, from uh, something probably the size of a grapefruit into the size of an orange. Um, now, uh, it, that is also um, an interesting way of uh, a metaphor for it, because you try squeezing uh, a grapefruit into the size of an orange, and you will find it's a very messy business. It squirts in all directions, uh, and you fail. Uh, the challenge of a nuclear weapons designer is to use um, uh, shaped charges of conventional highly high explosive in order to do this uh, without uh, the proverbial grapefruit juice squirting in your eye. Uh, I will stop um, my presentation there. Oli is now going to get into the real business, the weeds of the Iranian nuclear program. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming to this briefing meeting on our glossary. I don't think that I will provide any scientific uh, presentation here, but give you a snapshot where I believe today Iranian nuclear program is in two areas. One, where they might be with the uranium enrichment, and where they, what are those experiments which have been most likely done in Parchi, at Parchi. And I have put this thing together using information which the IAEA disclosed in its report in May this year. <coughs> Take that as a baseline. And since the IAEA report is not yet out, I have used actually the information and statements of Iranian leadership, what they might have in Natanz or in Com, and used no, those numbers and made an estimate what might be in the IAEA report, which is coming out in day or two's time. And <coughs> if we go back to May. So you saw that Iran had produced by that time at the fuel enrichment plant 
This is the underground facility in Natas. A little bit more than six tons of uranium hexafluoride uh, since it began its operations. They had 55 cascades of IR, one type of centrifuges there, but only 52 of them were operating that time when IAEA wrote the report. And the monthly production of uranium hexafluoride was about 230 kilograms per month. If we look then what might be there today and take the Iranian leadership and look, you know, how the centrifuges, centrifuges were distributed in Natanz and COM on this other underground facility, which is also called Fordo. So if I take those numbers, I think that they probably have increased less centrifuges in Natanz than in Fordo. And if we take the performance of those, it will be about 250 kilograms per month, now the monthly production. And there will be perhaps 57 cascades operating. At the four door, you remember that there were two sets of cascades which were interconnected. And this is the way you produce 20% enriched uranium, that you feed 3.5% enriched uranium in, you get from other end something which is close to 20%, 19.75 to be accurate. But then the tail from that system is about 10%. And you feed it to the second uh, set of centrifuges. So you run this uh, centrifuge two cascades in tandem. This is the most efficient way to uh, use the material of 3.5% enriched uranium to produce 20%. And there was a small difference between the performance between the Natanz pilot plant, which has a similar set of cascades, versus, uh, versus uh, GOM. But roughly, those two cascades produced a little bit more than 7 kilograms uh, UF6, 20% enriched uranium. And on that day, when IAEA made the report, there were two cascades which had been already installed, but they were not operating. And then they had another two uh, under construction. And this has led me to estimate that maybe what we will find in the IAEA report to come, that actually there are now four such units of 20% production operating in Natanz, oh, sorry, in COM, which means that the monthly production is now much higher. It's about 20 kilos, most likely at four door per month, UF6, 20% enriched, which means then that the inventories are picking up. And this, <coughs> uh, what we have seen in pilot plant is not very much changed. They probably run this original 20% production. They had their two more advanced centrifuges uh, cascades uh, under construction and installation, but they have intermittently use them for UF6 production. So we probably will see something similar, not a dramatic change. And what does this mean then in terms of the numbers? In May, if you put all the UF6, which Iran has produced to 3.5% enriched, was but 6.9 tons. And 1,200 kilograms of that was actually used to produce this 20% enriched uranium. Which means that every kilogram of 20% enriched uranium you produce, you need about 9 or 10 kilograms of 3.5% enriched uranium as a feed. And they had produced by last May 145 kilograms of 20% enriched uranium, but they have moved about 40 kilos of that to fuel pilot uh, fuel manufacturing plant in Isfahan, which manufactures fuel for Tehran research reactor. You recall that this is the justification for the enrichment of up to 10, 20 percent. What we will see then, most likely tomorrow, if we put all these numbers together, the inventory, cumulative inventory will be about 7.9 tons of UF6, 3.5 percent. 
and they have used now 1,700 kilos of that to produce 20% enriched uranium and 190 kilos of 20% enriched uranium has been produced, but uh, 40 kilos went for fuel manufacturing. So if we look then a road ahead and just assume that they continue with the current number of centrifuges, where will be at the end of this year, next summer or end of next year by the production of 3.5% enriched uranium? And you see from this diagram that uh, sometime in December they have about 8 tons of uh, UF6 in stock. Most likely some of it will be used then for 20% enriched uranium. And if they continue with this speed, you see that the end of next year it will be 10 tons of UF6. So not a dramatic change in terms of uh, amount of material if you look. If they increase uh, number of centrifuges with 10%, you will see 10% increase in the production. This is directly proportional. But the, where the change comes is the 20% enriched uranium. This is a very different scenario here. Now that they have been ramping it up, you see that the inventory, if we remove now the amount which went for fuel fabrication, in May, there was about 100 kilos of 20% enriched uranium. By now, it should be, as I, I mentioned, about cumulative production 175 kilos. End of this year, 275. And end of next year, 575. Now, if you take this amount and 250 kilograms of 20% uh, enriched uranium, and turn it to high enriched uranium, as Simon explained. You can get enough 90% enriched uranium for one nu crude nuclear device. About 20 kilos of high enriched uranium is needed. And how this was done by the AQ Khan is in this scheme. So what you do is you have four units here. The first unit you feed 3.5% natural uranium and get 3.5% enriched uranium out. The next unit takes from 3.5 to 20% enriched uranium. Then the third unit from 20 to 60 and then the last unit from 60 to 90. Now what Iran has there is the first two parts, the production of 3.5 and the production of 20. So if we, they want to go ahead, they need to reconfigure the uh, facility either to uh, make this, uh, take a use of existing centrifuges or actually to build a separate installation to do that. Most likely, if I were them, I would take the latter option because then you can optimize everything and you can use all centrifuges plus you don't need that many machines. For the latter part, if we make an ideal AQ current system, this whole system which we see in the picture on the right hand side had little less than 6,000 centrifuges. Most of them are in the beginning because that's where most of the effort is done. Once you have produced 3.5% enriched uranium, actually you have done 75% of effort which is required. When you produce 20% uh, enriched uranium, you have done 90% of your effort. So this last step actually only takes the 10% of the effort, and hence the number of centrifuges is much smaller. This diagram shows that material flows through straight, but in reality it's not. And this is for process control reasons. So actually what you do is, you take this 3.5% uh, enriched uranium out, put it to the cylinder, then you take this cylinder and feed it to the next unit, then you take it in a smaller cylinder out from 20% enriched uranium, move it to the next unit, feed it, take it to another cylinder, and then finally produce uh, UF6, uh, which has 90% enrich enrichment. But uh, you still need then to go ahead and 
produce uranium metal, which is needed uh, for uh, nuclear weapon. That process part takes still several weeks. It's not uh, something which you do overnight. And then let's, let me say a couple of words about parts in at the end. You saw that the IAEA <coughs> explained its concerns about certain experiments, which they call hydrodynamic experiments, at the parts in location in November 2011 report. And you probably have seen this kind of chamber in in many news media where you do these tests. And what these tests do, they do exactly what uh, what uh, Simon uh, explained. You test the simultaneity of those plates which compress uh, the nuclear weapon when the grapefruit goes to the size of orange or even smaller. And this, the essence is there, the timing because otherwise it gets messy. So you need to get this implosion coming from all directs, directions in a less than one microsecond <laughs> difference in order to be successful and compress it together. And what IAEA claims that the, these experiments which might have been done in parts in this chamber are those kind of experiments which you do to test the simultaneously, they talk about the half a, a hemisphere type of test and there are some information which say that they also look neutron initiators. I don't have the, all the details so I, I can't say what exactly took place. I, I didn't describe in very much detail. Certainly there is also a debate that whether this chamber is big enough to do all this. You have seen that. There are people who are pro, there are people who are con. But nevertheless I think that the most alarming thing here is that as soon as this came public things started to happen at Parchin. Uh, you have seen perhaps this report of the ISIS from April, which shows that there appears to be some kind of decontamination activities going on. It shows that uh, there's a water flowing from the building out. There has been soil movements, landscaping, etc. So one believes that maybe someone has done some sanitation. Then a couple of weeks ago we saw another thing where there tarps, these buildings are covered with this pink tarp, so that one really doesn't see what happens inside. Is the building ripped off? Another one built? We don't know yet. And the question then comes that, can IAEA ever find out what was there? Is this a mission impossible? <clears throat> well, we have some experience already from Iran. Concealment has been in place. We had the problems in Kalai Electric once the IAEA went for the first time there. Meanwhile, when they went for the second time, the whole place was renovated. Painted, nice tiles, everything very good looking. We had similar things happening in Natanz when this whole thing came almost exactly 10 years ago into public. What Iran did first, actually built a pilot plant to Natanz to demonstrate that actually they had done no experiments before. Natan's pilot plant is the first enrichment installation in uh, Iran. It was not the case. They started to work in Kalai. Then Lavisan Xi'an, which is here in the picture. This is uh, in Tehran, Lavisan district, where you see the buildings on the right-hand side top uh, was the so-called physics research center, which was then erased and raised and a park was built back with a good explanation. And then the activities were moved to elsewhere in Iran, and this you will find from the IAEA report in November. Laskar Abad, which was the laser enrichment installation, all the equipment was ripped off and uh, distributed, but the IAEA then got the information and found, found them. And then Fordo, the com underground facility which was built in secrecy. Most likely its purpose has been changed from the original and this is the reason why it's been <coughs> taking some time before the facility was able to operate because uh, there were major changes to the installation. So they have been there. How IAEA is going to cope with that? It has quite a few tools. First of all, all the information is not only in, for, in Parchin. 
you have a lot of other information which supports that people who worked, experiments which were done, where the equipment was built, where the diagnostic was built, all this can be used for this analysis. So even if the place is not that yet anymore there, this need to be explained. In addition to that, maybe the environmental sampling will help at least to see the salvage equipment, debris which might come, and, and the environment over there. And you may recall that you know we had uh, inspections in Syria on this bombed al Kipar reactor where everything was leveled down, but the IAEA was still able to find uranium particles in spite of all the sanitation. So the sensi uh, systems and measurement systems are extremely sensitive. So what I want to say, it's a difficult task, but all the eggs are not in the same basket. So I think that the truth will come out. Thank you. Um, Olin, before you, before you come down, um, let me just open by asking you, uh, I guess, what is probably on a few people's minds. I think I should do this from the microphone. Um, which is probably on a few people's minds, which is uh, questions about timetables. So, um, which I assume uh, IAEA reports don't go into. You know, where would Iran be in its pursuit of it chose to pursue a nuclear weapon? Um, could you give us your estimates about uh, um, uh, if you were... Uh, running the Iranian nuclear weapons program, um, uh, what the various paths would be for you um, I, um, if you wanted to do something as quickly as possible or if you wanted to do something um, as secretly as possible. Um, and I assume that there is a trade-off between the two. Um, what the various timetables would be for achievement of your goals? Well, I wish I had a good answer. <laughs> It's a very difficult because you, you have, as you pointed out, a variety of choices here. Do you want to do it in uh, uh, public places which are known, Natanz, Com, or whether you want to do a, some of it in secret place? Then we have to remember that the IAEA is present. So whatever you do in Natanz, as soon as the nuclear material starts to move, <coughs> IAEA will be telling to the international community in a couple of weeks' time that now something strange is happening. Also, if Natan's facilities change the configuration or the COM, IAEA will observe it in a couple of weeks' time. So therefore, I think that when we look at, we have also to keep in our minds that if someone does it, most likely wants to have a secret installation, at least for the last step. So one scenario would then be that, really, let the IAEA know that now I took all the nuclear material, went to place, which is secret, and then you dash through uh, that place by going from 20% enriched uranium to 90%. Now, if we look the known inventory, so 20%, it will be by end of next year or sometime next summer, enough for two nuclear weapons. So I think it's a little bit hard to think that someone renegades only with two nuclear weapons, because uh, it has consequences, so you need to have enough. Then you need to look also, this is nuclear material, so that's a key for the nuclear weapon. Then you need to have the design of the weapon. I think that the IAEA came to the conclusion that probably Iran has a design for a crude nuclear weapon. So that most likely, the understanding is there. Manufacturing of that probably doesn't take that long time. Then comes the third element, which is the delivery of the nuclear weapon. There, Iran might be, if I read you know, the statements from Mr. Elleman, might be lacking behind. If they want to do it, they probably don't have a, yet a design which fits and works with the missile you can deliver. Okay, someone may say that, well, there are other ways or means of delivering. And then we come perhaps to the situation like a North Korea, which has enough, perhaps, nuclear material for uh, half a dozen nuclear weapons, but it really doesn't have a, de a delivery vehicle. But certainly, one whoever is on the other side receiving end must be worried. So I don't think that we should let this thing go that far. And then comes the very good question, where is the red line here? Is it when one has enough nuclear material 
to produce a nuclear weapon or when one has a design completed for that. I would put the bar lower because what we still have are the uncertainties. There are things which we know, there are things which we don't know. And you, we need to think also of those things which we don't know. Okay. So, Thank you. not before next summer. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm going to turn to your questions now. I can't see everybody given all the lights, but uh, right here behind the camera. Yes. If you could just identify yourself. Uh, is this working? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, Stephanie Cook with Nuclear Intelligence Weekly. I have a question for um, uh, Mr. Heinonen. Um, so much is, emphasis has been placed on enrichment. What is the situation now with uh, the heavy water plant and the research reactor and the possibility that even Boucher could be used, fuel from Boucher could be used for future reprocessing. And also, just one question, is, is, has, is there any evidence of any plutonium production yet? Well, let me answer in three steps. First of all, Iran had some very simple plutonium separation ex experiments in early 1990s, but then it appeared that the interest went away, and then they were focusing more on uranium enrichment. Then. Where is the heavy water reactor in Arak or Kondab? What is the current status? We see that the building is under construction. IAR reports that uh, some uh, nuclear-related equipment starts to come. But again, there are two parts here. One is the reactor construction. One is the fuel. And if you look at the IAR reports, not much of the fuel has been so far produced for that reactor. So if I look that. I, I have seen that the Iran states that the reactor will be operating end of next year, 2013. I don't see from this technical information which is available that this will be very likely. So, but uh, it's a difficult to give an estimate for that. Then, w once it's operating, another year plus is needed before you have enough plutonium for, a, let's say, for first nuclear device. So you have to irradiate it for more than one year. Then you need to cool down. You cannot just take it straight from the reactor and do the reprocessing because it's too much radioactivity. So you probably need another year before you have the uh, plutonium. And meanwhile, you need to build a reprocessing plant so that you can do this. This reprocessing plant is not overly complicated. The technology is out there. You have seen the North Koreans were able to use it to get it from public domain and build their own. So I think Iran can do that fairly easily, but it will be visible. It's not a small installation, overly small installation. Then to process spent fuel from Pusher, that's a major undertaking. First of all, there you need to wait quite some time, even when you take it out from the reactor, you need to wait quite some time before you can process it, at least year two minimum because it's massive radioactivity and no reprocessing plant can ha handle it. So that kind of scenario is far away, and then it needs a much more massive reprocessing installation. If you look the size of that installation, that will be clearly visible in satellite imagery. If anyone starts to build, you need to have walls which are one and a half meter, one meter thick, very big complex, and if you remember it, North Korean, just a reprocessing plant canyon there. So it's about 100 meter long and it's about 30 meter broad. And the height is higher, about the height of this building. So this should be visible. And I don't think you can do it in much smaller scale if, if you want to do it. And that needs a little bit more know-how as well. Thank you. Uh, Charlie on my left. Um, Charles Perkins with APAC. Um, Oli, you talked about, um, you, you sort of brushed over the, the very end part of the enrichment where it, I guess, is assumed now that they would have the ability to convert the 20% uh, or 90% uh, then, if, if they went that far, uh, into a metal. Um, 
Is there evidence that they can do that? I mean, I know there's the, the issue of the machining hemispheres and so on, but is it just generally assumed that the ability to convert the gaseous uh, UF6 into a metal is pretty easy? And, and secondarily, you talked about the, the portion of the 20% that has been made into fuel plates. Does that, and, and this is relevant in terms of the diplomacy that focused on this, does turning it into a solid fuel plate uh, make it unusable for then reconverting into uh, bomb use or re-enriching it to the 90% to use in a bomb later on? First of all, uranium metal production. <coughs> this is all in public domain. You know, there's no big secret how you turn uranium hexafluoride to uranium metal. And actually, Iran has produced uranium metal. It was a vital part of the laser enrichment project in Lashkar Abad and in a Tehran Research Center. They produced, I think, several, maybe more than 100 kilos of uranium metal for that purpose. Certainly, the purity needs to be very different and done a somewhat different way. But I think that the basic know-how is there, so that shouldn't be a problem. Then, if you go back to the IAR reports, you will see that Isfahan fuel fabrication plant actually has a small process line which they probably got the design from China which can produce fuel for Tehran research reactor. It's a uranium metal alloy. So I think the basic things are there so it shouldn't be a really, really a, a problem for them. The uranium metal production. And then once you have Let's assume then at what to do with the Tehran research reactor fuel and whether you can use it again. Well, certainly you lose material when you turn it to 20% enriched uranium and you make it to plates. But as long as you don't irradiate those plates, you just take them back, you dissolve them, you turn it to uranium hexafluoride and you can go ahead. So you lose effort, you lose material, but some of it can be recovered. I would not be so worried about this 40 kilos which is there because that's a small amount. Remember that one needs 250 kilos for that. But if there is enough material sitting in plates and you have intention to go that way, yeah, you can do it. And actually there is an example on that. And this is from the Iraqi nuclear program. Uh, when Saddam pushed the people to rush in uh, 1991, no, no, 1990. So they had a plan to use part of the old high enriched spent fuel from the research reactor to replenish that part which they were not able to enrich since uh, their capability was a uh, little bit restricted in order to have the first nuclear weapon. And this is basically actually more complicated when you take uh, spent fuel and recover uh, high enriched uranium, which you then need to enrich a little bit higher in order to meet the specs. But uh, it, it's a question of months, not, not years. And from a short term, I would say three months or something like that. OK, thank you. Um, Jaap van Wessel, and then we'll move over. Yeah, from this and the Jerusalem report. I've been taught, a, a friend of mine who has been a prefix with the uh, Urenko in Holland. Is here? Yeah, it's, 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 it's not. Okay, go ahead, speak right into it. Yeah. Uh, I've been told that uh, a friend of mine who met with the uh, Urenko people in Holland who are familiar with the, uh, with the technology that the AQ can't stole there from Urenko, that uh, to make a nuclear bomb, that basically the technology is obsolete you can make a nuclear bomb, but it is very slow. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Is that correct? Uh, in a way, it's correct uh, in that sense that these machines, as I, I didn't spend too much time to explain the performance, but uh, the performance is uh, measured by a separate work unit. It's a kind of number which is actually in the glossary to a certain degree explained. And the design value of such uh, centrifuge which Iran now has, IR2, is about two or three swoop per year. But if you look their actual performance, it's less than one swoop per year. 
which means that if you want to, for example, to produce uh, uh, uranium for pusher power plant, you need 150,000 such centrifuges, actually one and a half time Natans with the current performance value. And based, based on this experience, AQ Khan decided that, you know, it's not good enough, and he then uh, developed this uh, other, which he got from German origin design for uh, Pakistani P2, which is three, four times more powerful. And I think that this assessment is good, but you get there, it just takes time, they break, so you have a little bit more waste, but if you are determined, you get what you want. And the time is, it's number of machines. So the more machines you have, the shorter is the time. Certainly it's not an ideal way to do it, but it's there. And that's why I think that this breakout scenario, which I mentioned, you know, I think it's waiting. If they want to do it, they need the better centrifuges in order to be it in a time short enough. Um, Oli, could you take a moment to, either you or Simon, to explain what um, the impact of uh, uh, cyber attack on this process, what do we know was achieved, and what do we know about the Iranians' ability to overcome that sort of external uh, cyber effort? Yes, I think that the cyber attack was a result of two things. One thing is that they went to the black market and a lot of information went out from the Iranian hands and it was very well known, the design of those centrifuges, all the documentation were, was there. And at the same time, they probably were buying equipment which uh, was contaminated. So whoever did the attack knew what to do because he had all the, or she had all the information. And actually there's a very good report written by Ms. Zetter from, uh, uh, what's the name of that? Uh, what? Wired. Yeah, Wired. So, and I, I know that she's coming with another uh, article or book on that. So read that one. I think it's a very accurate as far as I can judge. Well, Iran, learn, learn about it. I don't think it's going to be easy to do it again. Because you need to have the inside information. You need to have the inside access. And they have also created a special cyber command to protect their places. And actually, they realized already 2004, 2005 that something is happening because then they created this which is called Passive Defense Organization, the organization which designed the COM facility in order to protect it for air attacks. So cyber is there, but if someone wants to do something, it has to be done very differently. And historically, if we look, Sapotas has been all all around in 1950s, 1940s, the Russian nuclear weapons program was subject to sabotage. Uh, Chinese were sabotaged. Pakistanis were sabotaged. So it happened with Iran and will happen with the next proliferators as well. So one mean, but it doesn't solve the problem, but causes tremendous trouble. And we see the delay in Iranian program. It delayed it at least half a year. They lost a lot of uh, centrifuges, and we need to remember that the one bottleneck which they have are the raw materials, and they are difficult to get. So whenever uh, two, three thousand centrifuges are wiped away, it's uh, difficult to get the replenishment. So uh, you want to add something? Yeah. If I might uh, just expand a bit on uh, uh, how you use a cyber attack to uh, damage centrifuges. Um, it's all, you go back to my top-loading washing machine uh, analogy. If you turn off the electricity on and off when you're trying to run your top-loading washing machine, uh, it doesn't like it at all. Uh, the particular aspect of a centrifuge is that it's uh, a uranium enrichment centrifuge is that it spins at an incredibly high speed. Uh, and the challenge in designing it is to get it from zero to the high speed. Um, and it's a particular challenge because it's the nature of the design, whatever sh particular dimensions it is and the material that it's made out of, uh, that to go from high speed, uh, sorry, from zero to a high speed, it goes through what are called critical velocities, when it sort of wobbles slightly. And so uh, if it does go through critical velocities, it has to be designed in such a way 
uh, that it absorbs the strains and stresses of this without uh, bashing against the, uh, the side wall. And uh, this is done on a uh, uh, P1 centrifuge, which, uh, that's what the Pakistanis call it, uh, the Iranians call it the IR1, uh, by having it in uh, four sections with a little, essentially a flexible steel joint uh, three flexible steel joints uh, in it, um, which give that uh, ability for it to flex as it goes, um, uh, gets up to high speed. Um, now, you've probably all seen a critical velocity at work, although you probably haven't noticed that you've seen a critical velocity at work, which is in your days as a child when you had a spinning top and you would uh, get the top spinning and then watch it. Uh, their critical velocities exist for when it increases in speed and when it decreases in speed. So your spinning top, um, as it slows down, um, you can probably recall, would occasionally wobble uh, and then stabilize again before slowing down a bit more, and maybe a wo another wobble before eventually flipping, falling uh, to one side. And it's that little wobble which is a critical velocity. And you'll have to take it from me, they exist as they increase in speed as, as well as you decline it in speed, uh, it reduce it in speed. And so going back to a uranium enrichment centrifuge, if you can, uh, by a cyber attack, get into the control mechanism whereby you're playing around with the velocities of the centrifuges, uh, this plays hell with the critical velocities. And um, they, uh, they run out of control, the centrifuges uh, break and um, uh, and it can be a rather dangerous experience with, because the, these are high sp uh, uh, pieces of metal potentially moving at very high speed. Uh, but that's what the secret of um, the Stuxnet uh, 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 cyber attack essentially was. Okay. Thank you. Um, Maybe I add oh, one small thing. Sure, you know, commercial enrichment plants. Actually, they are not enriching all the time. But the centrifuges are spinning all the time. So this happens in Urenko that they may have some centrifuges which don't enrich for one full year. But they don't shut them down exactly for the reasons uh, <coughs> what uh, Simon said, because then they go through this resonance. It's not any centrifuge behaves like that. And then maybe to, to your mind, we need not mention, but the speed of this centrifuge, the IR1, when it spins in that uh, uh, casing, is 330 meters per second. It's actually the velocity of sound. And there are tremendous forces which are affecting to this. And someone compared it, it's the same th thing like put a 747 to uh, fly one meter above the ground. Uh, Hillel Fratton. Thanks. Um, I, I wanted to ask Mr. Hanonen uh, two questions. One, you suggested, you said something to the effect that the the purpose or the use of Ferdow had changed, and I wondered what you meant by that or how it, the use of it had changed. And the other thing, uh, question relates to Parchin. Um, insofar as it is the case that it's been primarily used to test um, conventional explosives and the, their use in compression. Um, is that the, the, the kind of uh, residue and, and evidence that would be looked at if uh, IAEA would get in there? Or is there a suspicion that there was actually use of some uh, nuclear materials uh, as well? So let me start from, thank you, start from the parts. Yes, this kind of chambers are used for many purposes, and I have understood from the IAR reports that there has been many other ex experiments which have not really to do anything with the nuclear. And what the IAR tries to find out, most likely based on this information they have from documentation and whatever they have, to find out if there are some features on those so-called nuclear exp experiments which have left traces, if they used uranium, then it's uh, perhaps an easy thing, but you can also use uh, 
surrogate material uh, to uh, uh, on these experiments without using nuclear material because nuclear material is difficult to get and you know it has to be handled differently even though uranium is fairly easy so I would not expect it but you can use other materials and maybe they have done it by purpose because if you replace uranium with something which is equally he heavy like tungsten the thing behaves roughly the same way so then you don't break the safeguards laws because the irony here is that if you take the safeguards agreement the way it is written if you do a nuclear explosive test without nuclear material you just design a nuclear weapon and do all the testing with, without any nuclear material, you are actually not in non-compliance with your safeguards undertakings. Certainly, this is against the spirit of the NPT, Non-Proliferation Treaty, which says that you should not do those activities if you have signed to that. But the IAEA mandate is the safeguards agreement, and therefore they cannot crucify you. Uh, but why the IAEA raises the concerns is that there is this non-compliance, a lot of undeclared activities, and there is a nexus to nuclear material. If you do this sort of experiments, maybe there is something going on somewhere else which you don't know, or there is a plan to build a nuclear installation. So this is where the uh, mandate comes from, together with the UN Security Council resolutions. So this was a part scene. And the first question, can you... Yes, that's true. Uh, if you read the IAEA report, this may be my speculation, but when this was uh, coming public in September 2009, IAEA went there about one month after the, uh, the announcement. There was no way that they were able to get there earlier for whatever reason, and they saw how the facility was on that day. Then when you read the next IAEA reports after that, Actually, they tell about the modifications to the facility. That is a puzzling thing, because when you design a nuclear installation, you design it from the very <coughs> beginning in such a way that you, don't, you install piping and you put things in place, that then a few weeks later you actually remove everything and do some excavation on the room to make it to different shape. It it, for me, kind of, is a kind of signal that maybe the design was for some other purpose originally than what it is today. And I think these are the questions which the IAEA is now asking, asking from Iran. And the other question there was also that uh, it appears from the satellite imagery and some other information that the design and construction started much earlier than what Iran has claimed. So that's why IAEA has also asked to see those original documents and procurement information which was related to that. Uh, Peter, get right in the middle please, and then Jackson. Peter Zimmerman, uh, you talk about experiments and I note that uh, not all of the physical and nuclear parameters of uranium metal are unclassified. Not all of the relevant things are available in the physics textbooks. How much of the experimental program that uh, we see in Iran seems to be devoted to measuring those characteristics and how much to um, the brute force of making an implosion, for example, which is uh, symmetric? Uh, I guess I'm asking for a comparison between the amount of physics they need to learn and the amount of uh, hydrodynamics they need to learn in engineering. Well, first of all, you know, I'm not a nuclear weapon designer. The second thing is that actually I don't think that uh, I want to comment those technical details, you know, what I uh, knows about those experiments and, you know, what it doesn't know. I don't think it's appropriate because I break my confidentiality undertakings if I, I, I do it. And from the report itself, you cannot uh, read much, you know, what actually is happening there. And then we need to keep in our mind a couple of other things. And 
is that actually the question is really that did uh, Iran get its hands to these uh, designs which AQ Khan distributed for nuclear weapons? There were two sets of designs. There was this one uh, which was lifted uh, from Libya and is here in the US in a vault not far from this place under IAS seal. And then there was a more advanced design which was then found later in some of the computers of this network people. And the question is that who got that design which was floating around around 93, 94, 95? And these are the questions which the IAEA has also asked from Iran and I don't think that they have got the uh, proper answer yet. Uh, Jackson Deal? In the back center, please. Yes, Jackson Deal of the Washington Post. The fuel plates that are being manufactured in Isfahan, are they usable in the TRR at this point? Would they be functional and therefore does Iran not need to import those fuel plates or rods from an external source in order to use the TRR? And my second question is, you mentioned that you thought they would need the P2 or the IR2 in order to complete the enrichment to bomb grade. They've announced several times that they're manufacturing the, the IR2, that they're installing the IR2. Do you, do you, what, is your, what do you think is the status of that? Thank you. First of all, <coughs> IR, TRR fuel. Uh, it's, a di it's not overly difficult to manufacture. I think that Iran has the basic knowledge because they saw these fuel plates being manufactured in Argentina in end of the 80s when the previous load of fresh fuel came to Iran. So the basic know-how is for sure there. The question is then that when you start the manufacturing of this, it has to go through very rigorous uh, quality assurance to make sure that they behave they, like they are, they don't leak, because anything like that will be very devastating in a reactor. So you need to make sure that the quality is there. And that's why you have seen a uh, fairly slow start for the production. Now they are, as far as I can see from the IAEA reports, they are now uh, having some test plates inside the reactor. Once these tests are over, I think they will take half a year, one year. Then they have to take them out, do the post-mortem analysis to make sure that they are, that there are no changes in the specifications. And only then you can go to actual production. So that should then, if they have been successful, this will then happen sometime next year. By that time, I think that Iran is going to run fairly soon out of fuel, and whether they are able to produce in, in quantities needed, we don't know, but I think that's there. Then the <coughs> second question was, can you repeat, I didn't get it entirely. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, I have here, you see that the P2 and, uh, or IR2M as they call, there are two IR2s. And I, actually I think that I have a, yeah, here is the IR2M, the one on the right hand side. Uh, so there are two IR2s, IR2M which is the taller one and then IR2 normal which is the smaller one. They have been now working as you pointed out, several years. And there is a thumb rule here from people who develop the centrifuges that during first year, you test one single machine. Once you are happy with that, you make next year a small cascade, maybe a few machines, few tens of machines. And then on the third year, if everything goes smoothly, you have a full cascade, which in this case would mean 164 machines running and you push uranium hexafluoride right through. And then after that, you come with something which is called a demonstration plant, maybe 1,000. So now they have been working already quite a long time with these IR2Ms, and they have not been able to feed all the time uh, UF6 through this cascade. What's the reason? Well, we can only speculate. Uh, one reason is that they still have design problems, that they have not been able to uh, solve all the manufacturing and design uh, parameters. 
The second thing is that they might have a lack of uh, raw materials because this centrifuge is very different. It doesn't use aluminum rotor. It most likely have a, has a carbon fiber rotor inside. And this kind of high strength carbon fiber is difficult to get in big quantities. And you need to have big quantities in order to maintain the quality and uh, homogeneity of the material. <coughs> then it's more difficult to manufacture than these other ones. But once you get it right, it lasts much longer time. So it may be a combination that there are some design problems, but the, perhaps the most difficult is to where to get the good quality carbon fiber in big quantities, plus the managing steel which they need uh, for the end caps and uh, bellows. Uh, Patrick Lawson in the front. Washington Policy. I want to follow up on the last question. In your chart about the amount of production that, that you anticipate there would be of enriched uranium in uh, six months, 12 months, 18 months, you seem to have assumed that roughly the same number of centrifuges are being used as the present. Well, uh, two questions about that. Why no more centrifuges? Why isn't Iran producing more centrifuges? What is the constraint on the production of more centrifuges? And the other question is, why not fewer centrifuges? Uh, at what point are the, uh, are the IR1 centrifuges they have going to start wearing out? If you look, let's talk first about the IR1. They have been increasing all the time, the number of centrifuges. You see also that they have I installed their 6,000 empty casings. So I assume that uh, they will have inner part for that. So from their, that perspective, I see that they are not going to sh stop the production of IR1 centrifuges anytime soon. Because once you install them, you know, it's difficult to rip them off and makes no sense. The question then comes at how many of those, uh, how much they have these raw materials. And is there a stock somewhere? Or are they able to produce these raw materials, particularly high strength aluminum and uh, maraging steel? Now, when they changed the focus in nuclear program around 2005 and started to work more indigenously when they saw the difficulties coming, one of the things which Mr. Akasade said in public is that we want to produce every tiny piece of centrifuge using our own resources, including raw materials. So therefore, I think we can conclude that most likely the casing materials which we see there now have been produced in aluminum factories in in Iran. The question is then that are they able to produce this 7075, which is a very high strength aluminum for rotors, or have they bought it from abroad? I think this is one of the key questions which uh, we need to know if we want to understand how it proceeds. So far, the tendency has been increasing. The life expectancy of those centrifuges is about 10 years, so 10% every year in principle will fail. So I think that we will see this trend. Then you ask, that why not more? Well, I can put any number, but then I said that 10% more will be 10% more production. But you know, you cannot produce 10 times more of them. That's a physical, uh, uh, physically impossible. So the game changer doesn't come from this IR ones. The game changer comes once the IR2s and IR4s are there, then the capacity will come on one step three, four times more than now with the same number of centrifuges. So this is where, which we need to understand uh, where to focus. Uh, Mike Kraft in the center in the back. Yeah, thanks very much, Mike Kraft, a counterterrorism specialist. I have a question from, a, from that perspective. The diagram that uh, Simon showed, and most of the discussions have been in terms of uh, nuclear devices and sort of a military mode, bombs or missiles. Can you comment on the possible scenario of what it takes for Iran to get to the stage of perhaps developing dirty bombs, uh, perhaps, you know, Rich, uh, using plutonium or something in a truck bomb or a ship bomb that may not cause the same kind of damage as a regular bomb, but would have a contamination and psychological effect. 
Well, would a state do this sort of thing? I think it is the first question we should ask, or whether it would be an, uh, more a terrorist organization which uh, picks that route. Uh, for the time being, you know, Iran is not really producing plutonium in such quantities that it can use it. It can irradiate small amounts in Tehran research reactor, but by far not, I think, quantities which are needed for this kind of purpose. So. Uh, I think that the risk is there, we need to take it seriously, but I don't think that this is the biggest thing we need to focus in case of Iran. Uh, thank you. Yes, Bob Friedman in front. Bob Friedman, Johns Hopkins University, a political question. Uh, is it fair to say that when Mr. Albarade was in charge of the IAEA, he tended to be more sympathetic in his overview of what the Iranians were doing, but his replacement is taking a tougher position? Is this a fair point? Uh, it's a fair point on certain way, but we have to also to remember that the time has passed, you know, and. Uh, Iran has done certain selections on the route, you know, to the enrichment. So you cannot just compare, you know, what is there today, what was there in 2003. So I think that the, uh, you cannot just pull the parallel. But then I think that the El Baradai's approach was pretty much that, you know, unless you are pro proven uh, guilty, you are innocent. And uh, he had a very high requirement for the proof and evidence, as, as you know. So it's the only thing I can say. And then I think that you have to look also at the time, you know, 2002, 2003. What the IA tried to do, and I was part, the party of that, party to that, is that we tried pretty much, since the evidence was still thin to certain parts, that uh, to try this uh, approach of transparency and cooperation. And this was also prompted by the approach of EU3, because it was not El Baradai who decided or not decided whether Iran is in compliance. It was a part of the understanding of this EU3 process that it will be handled in a certain way in the IA and the case is not sent to Security Council. This was the agreement in November 2003. So it, in a way, tied somewhat the hands of the IAEA secretary. Was not able to go against the will of the board of governors. If you go back now today into history, many things should be done perhaps differently. <laughs> Oli, let me ask you one uh, a final question. Um, a few minutes ago, I asked you to put yourself into the shoes of uh, the head of the Iranian nuclear program. Yeah. Um, now I'd like to ask you to put yourself in the shoes of the head of some, so say, some foreign government who decides that it's important to put a stop to what you're seeing here. Um, is there a, what would be the link in the chain that, from your perspective, would be the most attractive and amenable target to significantly <laughs> delay? To significantly delay. Let's not throw out, you know, hypothetical cases of destroy something like this, but to significantly delay. What would be the most um, uh, appropriate target that would push the Iranians back a substantial period of time? I, I don't think there's a... One th very, very simple thing is a, not a surgical strike, but sledgehammer, so that the people really change their mind. And that's what happened. People very often compare uh, that, you know, look what happened in Iraq, you know, they, uh, they went underground. But they didn't go underground in 1991. Actually, now when you go to the records, uh, Saddam Hussein gave up his, his nuclear weapons program. That's so, so simple. So what we need to do is to ha send such a message or give such a choice to Iran that they don't proceed that route which they might be proceeding and clarify all these issues. And it doesn't need to be a, a nuclear or, or a military attack. It can be something more. Uh, more on, on the economical side. The problem what we have really is that uh, now all these sanctions, you know, in place. I don't know how, what is the price of one swoo, which they now produce in, 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 uh, in uh, 
Natas, but I know that Urenko sells it $130 a swap. If you put those billions of billions of dollars which Iran uh, is losing and is producing uh, maybe thousand swoop per year or two thousand, you know, three thousand, it doesn't compare. So I think the economical uh, solution is perhaps the most viable and it has to be then both sides, Iran has then to comply with that and there needs to be a grace period and I think after that they will probably forget these P1s because they are not really to produce fuel anymore for for uh, nuclear reactors. They were good in 1970s but it's like a, putting a Volkswagen Beetle to race with Fo Ferrari in Formula One. Okay, Ole, thank you very much. Simon, did you have a final comment you wanted yes. to add? I just wanted to say uh, two things. One is that um, we were sort of half expecting, but uh, the IAEA didn't cooperate with us on this issue, that the, their latest report on Iran would uh, have been published in Vienna today and would have already leaked by the time we had this lunch. Uh, it, this luncheon was going to be this luncheon anyway. Um, uh, and so there was a hope and a prayer there. I hope you found it a satisfactory meeting anyway. And uh, But when this report does come out, uh, go to this uh, report on our website. It's also on the Belfer website. Um, and uh, if you can't understand any of the uh, uh, terms in the IAEA report, uh, then look them up here. And um, certainly for those of you who looked a bit puzzled when Oli just now started talking about SWOOs, that is of course a separative work unit, SWU, and of course it is here, and it's all too obvious what a SWOO is when you read it here. Thank you. <laughs>